It's very easy in these events to, uh, to end up sitting really comfortably, so I'd like you to stand up for a moment, please. <laughs> Great. Okay, we're going to exercise our shoulders. I'd like you to move your shoulders backwards and forwards a little bit. That's it. Release some tension here. And up and down. That's it. Touch your ears with your shoulders. Up and down. And you can move your head side to side as well. Uh, are you enjoying yourself? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay, could you turn and face this way, please? That's uh, so it. You put your hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you. <laughs> Move if you have to. Come along. Don't be boring. That's it. Give a good massage. Right. Just feel. Oh. Do I feel good? Okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Now you turn and face this way. <laughs> Payback. <laughs> Thank you. Do take a seat, preferably on your own chair. <laughs> I will start off by saying, um, when I've given presentations in Slovenia before, I start off by saying, O prostite damoj slovenština ni še dobro, or whatever else. Um, and I'll tell you a little story just before I get cracking with all of this. Um, and that is that when I very first arrived in Slovenia, um, I came to present a project called Woodlands Center for Lifelong Learning. I thought it would be great if I put this in Slovene as well on the bottom of the piece of paper to so show a real interest in language. So I put Center for Lifelong Learning into Google Translate and copied and pasted what came out and put it on the bottom of my, I thought, look, it's got some Slovene on it. It's got lots of Vs and Zs. I'm really impressed. Look. <laughs> And when I came over to Slovenia for the first time in January 2006, I handed my little brochure over to this lady in the Ministerstvorzaschotstvorin spot. And she said, <laughs> and she looked at this thing and laughed and laughed until the tears were streaming down her face. I thought, this is, I thought it was a good idea. <laughs> and she said, no, I need to explain. There's one of the words there that's not really the right word. It's središče. Za, you said lifelong learning. Središče za dosmrtno izbrževanje. So she very quickly put me right, and ever since then I've been a little bit wary of trying to say too much off script in Slovene. Um, I'd like to talk to you about chaos in the classroom, um, and the subtitle is, um, and why we need more of it. Um, I want to make clear from the outset that when I say chaos in the classroom, I don't mean that, <laughs> okay? Um, nobody likes to see that going on in a place of learning. What I mean is more that than that. And I'd like to tell you a little bit of why, about why I think that's really important for building life skills for young people, for coping with the kind of life that they're likely to have to encounter. The old style of education, which dates back to the Industrial Revolution and putting children on conveyor belts and saying, at that age you do that, at that age you do, then you do that, and you, do, you can't remember that, you're stupid, forget it, go and be a forester or something. Sir Isaac Newton is the guy who came back, has so much to answer for, came up with a model of physics, which basically says, if you do that to it, it'll do that. Right? If you put that energy in, that's what you get out the other end, equal and opposite reactions. It will stay put unless you apply a force to it. His three laws of motion, which every child has had to regurgitate in a test. And Newton's cradle and blah, blah, blah. We now know that, yeah, it's a, it's a theory. These are Newton's theories rather than laws. It's not quite that straightforward because these things never actually operate in a complete vacuum where there is nothing else affecting them. Physics is really into quantum physics, into chaos theory these days. And it's a very, very exciting area to be into. And it applies across everything we do. This, I think, is one of the most beautiful things out there. I love these things, Mandelbrot sets. Where, I don't know if you've seen these animations where you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. It doesn't matter where you zoom in on, it will always end up looking a bit more like of more of that. It's the same as if you say this piece, of, this piece of something is one meter long. It's never exactly one meter long. 
depends how, to what resolution you want to measure it. Is it 1.00001 meters long? And trying to get it exactly right is where this whole chaos theory comes in. This is one of my favorite pictures. I always like to show a picture of a cauliflower whenever I'm giving a presentation on anything. Um, <laughs> so, um, Svetach, is that right, Svetach? Um, so this is a cauliflower, but if you see the, the, the similarities with the Mandelbrot set, there is no way you can predict when you put that seed in the ground exactly what that cauliflower is going to look like when it comes out of the ground. We've seen other examples of chaos theory at work recently um, in less desirable circumstances than a good organic cauliflower. Um, this is Japan recently. No, we know how fantastic the Japanese are at planning things building things exactly how it should be, duplicating a very, very regimented, very clear, structured way of working. That's what Japan looks like at the moment, parts of it. Other parts of the world where chaos theory is busily at work, and has been for some years, There's one way of drawing art, using rulers and planning things and making things look exactly right. But there is another kind of art that goes on behind the scenes. Another way of educating children is to sit them in straight rows and tell them, you have to remember this, go home this evening and learn it, tomorrow I will test you. If you get it right, you're a good student, you get to five, you can go to university. Here's some facts I learned at school. These are facts. Bonn is the capital of Germany and they use currency called Deutsche Marks. I wrote it in a test. I got full marks. I'm a very clever person. I went to university. USSR is a communist country. It's the biggest country in the world. Very clever. Well done. You are good at geography, aren't you? Hosni Mubarak is the president of Egypt. That book was only published last year. It must be right. This is the most recently approved by the ministry textbook. It's got to be right. How about this one? My dad bless his heart, had to go to the board, board of management, to get the okay for funding to expand the office computer's memory by 8K. <laughs> this was an extra board that needed, you know, putting in there and had to be ordered from America and took three months to arrive. And it was a big enough item that it had to go through the board for expenditure. Compare that with what's going on today. This is a, a little bit which I picked off Amazon.com, there's a 32 gig micro SD card with 54 pounds or something, special offer, reduced from 133 pounds. That has happened within my father, half of my father's working life. Let's have a look at one or two other things that have changed in recent living memory. We've lost some zeros somewhere down the line. <laughs> That is less than 100 years of aviation history. Tiger Moth to A380. This is one of my favorites. This has happened in my lifetime, no problem. This thing here, the good old VHS video recorder. Good old, there we go. Um, we put the cassette in the top and press the buttons down to press it and play it. And my father still can't record, um, program his to record. This thing here, I'm not an Apple aficionado, but that thing records HD video. That's... <laughs> How about that? I used, when I was a kid, I had to walk for 25 minutes to the nearest one of those. Once a week when I was allowed to, to phone mummy. I was at boarding school. Now look, I mean... <laughs> this, I want, this one I really love. This was the kind of computers that we still had one in the storage cupboard at my first job. Now we have, around Africa, children with these one-per-child laptops connecting to the internet via an ad hoc networking arrangement, accessing the internet. Each child has their own laptop. They don't need electricity. They wind up, have a little generator built into them. And this is empowering children like you could not believe. This is one of my favorite things. I'm going to read to you what it says on the bottom. This was from 1954. It says, scientists from the Rand Corporation have created this model 
to illustrate how a home computer could look like in the year 2004. <laughs> However, the needed technology will not be economically feasible for the average home. Also, the scientists readily admit the computer will require not yet invented technology to actually work, but 50 years from now, scientific progress is expected to solve these problems. Here's the great bit. With a teletype interface and the Fortran language, the computer will be easy to use. <laughs> now, I love this bit here. Okay. Well, uh, the mind boggles. I don't know if this is some sort of cursor control key or something else that goes on there. I think that's wonderful. 1954, that's future gazing 50 years ahead. That's when the curriculum was last really radically overhauled. We know what a home computer actually looks like in 2004. And it hasn't got that big thing there. The jog wheel is that size. <laughs> and she doesn't need to know Fortran. So this chaos theory is trying to get people comfortable with this level of change, not knowing where things are going next. And it addresses the difference between education and training. If people are well educated, they are prepared for whatever life may throw at them. If they're well trained, they could do something well. If that ceases to exist, they're lost. So I feel the most important thing is to educate young people to cope with change. We seem to do it really well when they're little. And kindergartens the world over sort of look like that. And we're perfectly OK with it. But something changes. I think they get bigger and hairier and whatever else. <laughs> and the teachers get scared of them. So we do that to them. We sit them in straight rows and go all Newtonian physics on them. As those drive, standing them in straight lines like this is going to prepare them for jobs that look like this. Ready for living in houses that look like this. And it does this to them because it doesn't prepare them for what they need. It's not scratching where it itches. It dates back to, I was saying about Newtonian physics, I love this picture from 1377. This is what the universe looks like. This is official. You better believe it, because if you disagree, if you disagree, we're going to burn you. Right? There's God. And there's all the planets and the stars, all painted on the crystal spheres which rotate around the Earth. That's the way it is. You better not think otherwise. It looks a little bit like that, don't you think? Teacher as God, I call it. The teacher stands at the front and talks. The children sit quietly and listen and write answers to tests, and they're considered good students. End of story. That's it. Now, we actually know that the universe looks like that. It's a bit different from what they thought in 1377. And I would say that the model for teaching needs to do the same thing. That actually, the teacher isn't the center of the universe. Teacher isn't God. Teacher is part of the equation is one sun amongst the constellation. I love this picture. Does anybody know what that is? Brains. Ah, brains. <laughs> they're, they're awake, Mate. Um, this is the way the brain works. These bits here are synapses firing. This is something happening in your brain. This is not. Right? That's what happens after a little while. If you don't use it, you lose it, basically. Uh, they discover this about Alzheimer's and all sorts of things. But the more you do this, the more you think about things, you create what are called permanent neural pathways. You remember things. That's how it goes. But actually, when you zoom in, that kind of chaos theory, remember the cauliflower, remember the Mandelbrot set, that's what it's all like in the middle of everything. The way bees operate is exactly the same sort of thing. And understanding that is very exciting. In a traditional method of teaching children, you might get them out of a, some kind of a textbook written in whenever it was. It says, how many bees are there in Brazil? And you know, there's 36 squillion, zillion, million, zillion, billion, whatever. And you go home that evening, you learn it, and you write it in a test to the very good, clever student, Pitt, yeah, yeah, to, to, to university. Right? <laughs> or, is it, or is it squillion, or is it zillion, centillion? Oh, I can't remember. Stupid child. 
go off this way. Now, I would say that rather than memorizing these things, what is more important is what is the story behind that number? How did you find that number out? Do you believe, how do they know how many bees are there in a country the size of Brazil? Hang on a sec. Who do I trust to give me this information? Okay, okay, so we have some means of hypothesizing, shall we say about that. Do I trust that person? Is it somebody trying to make me think something? Has that number gone up or down in the last 10 years? Is that a problem? What else are the bees doing other than buzzing around and looking chaotic? They're, apart from anything else, they're pollinizing crops. They're not just making honey. They're pollinizing crops. They're doing a very important job. And the reason I chose Brazil as an example, that's where the Africanized bee, the killer bee, started out. Went out killing honeybees. And that created a problem because, you know, look your way around, the graph did that of the number of honeybees out there, and then there were serious problems. So classic model of education, where you say, go away, learn this number. A chaotic way of thinking of it is say, I want you to find out about bees because there's something important going on here. How do we do this? A typical traditional classroom model, if you like. You can apply this elsewhere. I'm not just talking about classrooms. You'd have approved textbooks. They're fond of having approved textbooks in some places. Closed questioning means I want an answer to this question. You get it right, you get it wrong. If you get it right, you're a good student. If you don't, you're stupid. Defined body of knowledge. You need to know this, you need to know this, you know, catalogues, nanny. You need to know this, you need to know that, you need to know that. If you know it all, you're very clever. The teacher tells you what you need to know. You go away and learn it. You're a good student. The teacher's an authoritarian figure, stands at the front. Everybody else sits quietly. If you sit quietly, you're a good student. I'm going to challenge each of those four. This approved textbooks thing, first of all, let's throw that out. Why not give the kids an opportunity to explore all the stuff available to them? What is all the evidence available out there? The one thing which I think has changed everything, more than anything else, is the internet. That internet has changed in the last 10 years beyond recognition. What's it gonna look like in 50 years from now when our children are as old as me? Well, you know. Instead of closed questioning, where we say, I want to know the answer to this question, is it right or is it wrong? I'm saying open questioning says, well, what do you think about that? Is that a problem? Do you agree? How about that? Oh, but have you thought of, oh yeah, that's a good point. And actually for a student to ask the teacher and the teacher say back, that's a really good question. I have no idea. How are we going to find out? Fact to inform in context. This is that bees thing again. Rather than just knowing, having to know how many bees there are, I want to know what about, what's the story behind it? And the teacher, rather than an authoritarian figure, is somebody there to guide you through that exciting process of learning, of finding out of being curious, of being hungry for knowledge. That's how you make lifelong learners. That's how you make people that want to go on to business school, who want to find out more, who want to improve themselves. It's a plumber who goes and gets a doctorate in fine art in his 50s because he suddenly one day is freaked out by something he saw in Venice and wants to know more. That's what it's all about. And that's why I feel that education is so important. The classical model is like filling a bucket with water and you measure how much of it leaks out. I'd like to see a model which is a little bit more chaotic than that, in the same way as fueling a fire. You light the fire, you provide it with the stuff it needs, the extra bit of air, a few extra carefully placed sticks, you construct that nicely, and you get a good fire. You don't know exactly where every one of those flames goes. Everything I've said you should take with a pinch of salt, go away, think I'm completely mad, but I'm English, so what do you expect? Um, but I'd also like to say that everything in life is in balance. This is where we've heard a lot of things today. If I can tie one or two things together, um, with what Claudia was saying about work-life balance. There's two kinds of balance as well, and you need to keep these in balance. There's a sort of empirical balance here, which is absolute. If you put 51.1 grams on that side, you put 51.1 grams on the other side, and it balances. You're right. But there's also another kind of balance. Perhaps a more negotiable sort of balance, a fluid kind of a balance. So don't fall off, take it steady, whoa, a bit of a wobble sometimes, but you've got the idea. 
That's the kind of balance I'm interested in. That's the bit that's got a little bit of chaos theory in it. There's your chaos theory balance as against the new Newtonian balance. That's all I need to say. Thank you for listening.